Okay. Uh, Dr. Halegua is a rheumatologist specializing in clinical research, patient care, and teaching in Los Angeles. He's affiliated with Cedar sinai Medical Center and is an assistant clinical professor of medicine for the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is also a member of our board of directors and has previously, previously served as our board chair for four years. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Halegua to today's um, webinar. I want to thank you for taking your time out um, to provide this presentation for us. So I'm going to hand it over to you now. Dr. Holigua? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you can share your screen now. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on our uh, second webinar presentation. Um, this is going to be a presentation on early ankylosing spondylitis, and uh, it's my pleasure and a privilege to do this on behalf of the Spondylitis Association of America. As Melissa said, I'm uh, a, an assistant professor, and I practice full-time in uh, rheumatology, and I have a special interest in ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is an illness that actually belongs to a family of illness, uh, illnesses that overlap with each other. As you can see in this slide, there are probably six different individual manifestations, or if you want to call them separate illnesses, that overlap with ankylosing spondylitis. And I would like to call them as a family of illnesses, better termed spondyloarthritis. So the prototype is ankylosing spondylitis, which is the circle that you see in the middle. And this disease uh, borrows its name from two Greek terms, ankylos meaning to fuse, and spondylos meaning the spine, and of course itis meaning inflammation. So it's a disease that basically gives you inflammation of the spine and then proceeds to fuse later on. However, in this illness, per se, there are other manifestations that occur, which we will cover during the presentation. Um, peripheral joints, for instance, can be involved. The spine is not the only place that this disease affects. The peripheral joints that are most commonly involved are the shoulder joint and the hip joint. About 20 to 30 percent of ankylosing spondylitis patients will have involvement of these joints. And this joint, uh, a hip joint, for instance, could be the first joint that is affected and the first manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis. Hip joint involvement initially or later on in the course actually carries a worse prognosis, meaning that there could be more fusion in the future in the spine if a person has involvement of the hip. Um, let's go to some of the uh, other illnesses that overlap with this condition. So there are things that are in common with ankylosing spondylitis, these conditions, and then there are things that are very unique. So let's move on to psoriatic arthritis. Well, psoriatic arthritis, in uh, the simplest terms, is arthritis that occurs in the presence of psoriasis, which is a skin condition which we will look at. I just wanted to highlight some differences. The main difference is that more often than not, peripheral joints are involved in psoriatic arthritis, unlike ankylosing spondylitis. So small joints in the hands, uh, large joints of the lower extremities, like the knee or the ankle, are involved more commonly in psoriatic arthritis. And obviously, the skin is involved in psoriatic arthritis, and this is not the case with ankylosing spondylitis. In addition, some of the internal organ involvement that occurs in ankylosing spondylitis, such as the lung and the heart, which we'll talk about later, does not occur with psoriatic arthritis. The spine involvement in psoriatic arthritis appears to be a little bit different. 
it appears to be more asymmetric, and uh, we will we'll talk about it a little bit later, where it, it tends to skip spinal segments and not involve su successive spinal segments. Arthritis associated with inflammatory bowel disease refers to the arthritis that occurs with Crohn's disease and with ulcerative colitis. In this illness, the joint involvement, unlike psoriatic arthritis, tends to be more large joint involvement, such as a knee, an ankle, or hip, or uh, perhaps wrist, and very rarely small joint involvement in the hand. The um, arthritis that affects the spine in this uh, subset of illness tends to be like ankylosing spondylitis, very symmetric, starting from the bottom of the spine and then climbing upward, but does tend to be less severe than ankylosing spondylitis and does not tend to fuse the entire spine. Of course, the biggest difference is that there's a uh, profound involvement of the uh, gastrointestinal tract in the colon alone in ulcerative colitis and in the small bowel uh, and colon and the oral cavity with uh, Crohn's disease. Um, there are also a number of skin manifestations that occur with this subset of illness where you get um, raised uh, nodular lesions of the skin called erythema nodosum in this subset. And in fact, erythema nodosum can involve a majority of the uh, body in some cases. Juvenile spondylarthritis uh, refers to the subset that has its onset of less than 16 years of age. In this subset, it is more common to present just with fever and pain at the attachment of tendons, uh, tendon sites to the bones. So tendon attachments to the heel, tendon attachments to the hips, um, to the elbows, these get inflamed and painful, and the child also has fever. And this is unlike the early onset of ankylosing spondylitis, where you get inflammatory pain mainly in, this, in the spine. These children may go on to develop inflammatory back pain and uh, typical AS symptoms, but more often than not, the presentation is different. Undifferentiated spinal arthritis is a condition where you do not get the typical manifestations that are seen with psoriatic arthritis, arthritis of the inflammatory bowel disease or juvenile arthritis. You just have large joint involvement, often in an asymmetric manner, in only one knee and one ankle, and uh, do not you do not have any spinal involvement other than perhaps some inflammatory back pain and you may or may not have sacroiliitis on one side or the other. There is no typical manifestation to label it as one of the other conditions. Reactive arthritis briefly is um, after an infection, either a genitourinary infection like chlamydia or a bowel infection like um, Shigella or Salmonella. And you get arthritis very similar to undifferentiated spinal arthritis in one or more joints of the lower extremities and uh, tends to be self-limited, does go away in a year, so not everybody has their illness go away. Acute anterior uveitis, we'll see a slide of it, can be a subset by itself or can occur with the, any of the other um, spinal arthritis. Okay, let's move on. So what are some of the early symptoms of uh, ankylosing spondylitis? Well, inflammatory back pain in the lumbar and sometimes the thoracic spine is an early symptom. I want to emphasize that women tend to present a little bit different than men with ankylosing spondylitis in the early stages. Women often have thoracic spine pain, so this is the um, upper back, the portion of the back just below the neck and above the lumbar area. These areas um, have these spinal vertebrae that um, articulate or join together with the ribs. And it's often these joints between the ribs and the vertebrae that get inflamed in women in the early stages and often is misdiagnosed as uh, women who have 
uh, chest pain due to anxiety and so on. And this often leads to a delay in diagnosis, particularly in women. Um, we will cover what inflammatory back pain is um, specifically in a subsequent uh, slide. Other people, uh, typically male, but women too, may present with a acute uh, pain uh, that's on one side or the other in the buttock and the lower back. This is the location of the sacroiliac joint, the joint that is the uh, whose involvement is the hallmark of this condition. This pain is typically worse at night when people are not moving. And um, when they get up and move in the morning, it improves and gets better. That is one of the hallmarks of inflammatory pain as well, which we'll talk about later. There's also loss of spinal mobility, uh, and we'll see some ways to measure it. One of the measures is a Schober's test, where, uh, which we'll see in a subsequent uh, slide. Another test that's done to measure uh, mobility is chest expansion where a rheumatologist or your doctor would take a tape measure, put it under the, uh, at the level of the nipples and, and uh, do a measurement in full expiration, that is breathing out completely, and then with full inspiration, so breathing in and expanding your, spine, uh, your chest wall and measuring the difference to see what it is. And normally it's about five centimeters. Anything less, less than that, would be suggestive of uh, a uh, restricted chest wall, which is seen with ankylosing spondylitis even early on. One has to remember that some of this decrease in chest expansion is due to pain and is reversible with some of the medications that are used to treat it. We talked about the hip involvement and the decreased range of motion. That can be seen in early um, AS as well. So this is a, uh, a slide that shows how the Schober's test is done. It is a measure of spine flexion. Um, there, there is normally an increase in length of a 10 centimeter line um, by at least 5 centimeters. So if you look at the slide here, you can see this is a 15 centimeter line uh, that has been measured. And this uh, measurement is made way before the person bends over. So what we do typically is we mark a point at the level of the dimples in the back, uh, which is basically where the sacroiliac, um, no, I'm sorry, the sacroiliac joints as well as the uh, junction of the lumbar spine and the sacrum or the tailbone is. We put a point there, we measure a line in the midline, 10 centimeters above it, and mark that point. In the old Schober's test, we would measure a line 5 centimeters below this as well and get a 15 centimeter line. In the modified Schober's test, we only do a 10 centimeter line above the lumbosacral joint. After we get this 10 centimeter line in the modified Schober's test, we have the person bend forward as much as they possibly can and then measure the increase in the length of this line between these two points when the person is bent forward. The normal increase is more than 5 centimeters, or at least 5 centimeters. So the 10 centimeter line in the modified Schober's test becomes 15 centimeters. If it's less than 5 centimeters, it is suggestive of ankylosing spondylitis. So here's a depiction of somebody bending forward, and we would have a point here at the level of the, um, in the midline of in the, at the level of the lumbosacral joint, another point up here. There is also a test uh, for side flexion that is useful in following patients with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And, you know, as we will talk about later, the challenge often is to differentiate between mechanical low back pain, which is back pain due to disc disease or facet joint arthritis, a, a joint in the spine, um, with uh, people who exercise or are very active otherwise, these people can have back pain as well. Well, those patients do have back pain, but their back pain increases when they bend forward typically. And uh, whereas ankylosing spondylitis, there's not only restriction when you bend forward, but there's also restriction when you bend sideways. Um, and that helps differentiate 
your back pain from those of a patient with back pain due to disc disease as well. So let's look at what is inflammatory back pain. Well, these are some of the factors that identify it. Um, onset of the pain less than 40 years of age is one of the factors. A, a more insidious or gradual onset of pains rather than a sudden onset of pain that might be that might occur with you know, moving some heavy furniture or lifting something very heavy. Persistence of the pain for more than three months is also a factor. Association with morning stiffness, where you feel very stiff in the morning, it lasts more than half an hour, and it gets better after half an hour, is another factor. Improvement with exercise, where the pain gets better as the day goes along, is also a factor. If you have four out of five five factors, it is considered diagnostic for inflammatory back pain, which is one of the earliest symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis. At this stage, typically x-rays and other imaging modalities may be negative, and all you have are symptoms to try to identify the illness. And it, it may be seven to ten years before you get a diagnosis. The sacroiliac joint, which is seen right here, it's a very difficult joint to image because it is oblique in orientation. We have specific positioning techniques to try to identify this uh, joint uh, clearly and identify inflammation in it. However, the um, joint is uh, again in, not involved till a later uh, stage. It may take up to 10 years for typical sacroiliitis to develop. CTs and MRIs are more sensitive than x-rays in detecting early sacroiliitis in patients who have uh, inflammatory back pain. We'll look at an example of an MRI. And if you have a positive MRI, there is a predictive uh, value of this MRI, meaning that 60% of these patients with a positive MRI will develop typical sacroiliitis and that uh, can be seen on an x-ray after three years. So a positive MRI means that most of these patients will be become um, classic ankylosing spondylitis later on. In this x-ray, you can see that there is an increase in the density of the bone on the uh, ilium bone side of the sacroiliac joint. So this is the sacrum and this is the ilium. This is early uh, AS, meaning that AS has been there for only seven years. In my opinion, um, less than three years is early AS, and after three years, we're uh, talking about more, you know, established illness. Um, though x-ray changes take a long time to occur, as we talked about. So here's an MRI, and an MRI has the advantage over x-rays in that it can detect inflammation in the joint. There are various techniques to do it, and this is an MRI of the same patient here. Here we have what is called a T1-weighted image, where you see the bone very well, but you don't see the water content. But when you do T2-weighted image and you suppress the fat, that's typically seen in images on T2 weighting, and fat looks the same as water, then you see the typical water accumulation due to inflammation in the uh, sacroiliac joint. So here again, here's the sacrum, here's the ileal bone, and that's the joint, and right next to the, um, uh, the uh, uh, joint uh, surface, there's water accumulation diagnostic of inflammation. And MRIs are probably useful, but first you have to identify the patient with inflammatory back pain before you can do. The other uh, thing that is important is that MRIs are sensitive to change with effective treatment, and we'll see that later. What about uh, x-rays, you know, of the lumbar spine and the rest of the spine? Well, on the right-hand side of the slide, you will see the bridging syndesmophytes. This is not seen early on. This is seen five, ten years into the illness, and we want to prevent that from happening. And you know, active research is uh, uh, right now going into preventing fusion of the spine. But early on in ankylosing spondylitis, 
you may not see anything in the in the spine at all. Um, the uh, the spine, the vertebra normally have a biconcave shape, but sometimes early on you can see what is called squaring of the vertebra, and it's very hard to tell. But you know, maybe if you look closely and compare this vertebra that is more biconcave and this one, you can appreciate that it's losing some of its concavity. You know, this area also should be concave, and you can see that this has become straighter rather than, you know, the concave appearance that should be there present in, in, the, in the front of the vertebra. So this squaring is, can be an early symptom. My experience is that it may take a couple of years to present itself, and you won't see it in the first year of the illness, but it, it, you can see it. And, you know, AS symptoms don't get better with, uh, with aging. What typically happens with aging is that you get more squaring, you get the syndesmal fights, and you get more fusion. So um, I, I don't think that uh, AS symptoms become less um, as you grow older. Um, the, uh, um, let's move on to the next slide here. Well, you know, we, we all want to have an earlier diagnosis, and to that extent, the Spondylitis Association in the past uh, three years has raised over half a million to develop a questionnaire to screen patients for inflammatory back pain. So the criteria that I showed you earlier that's used to diagnose inflammatory back pain plus additional questions were put together and a panel of AS patients were used to develop a validated questionnaire. And uh, the good news is that the questionnaire is ready. Uh, we have submitted it for publication in a peer-reviewed journal of medicine. And once it's published and uh, the, the manuscript is printed, then we are free to use the questionnaire. And our hope is that we'll be able to use that questionnaire widely on the Internet and distribute it to physicians so that people who have back pain will come across this and take the questionnaire and be directed to their physician in order to establish a, a diagnosis earlier. Let's talk about some of the other early symptoms that occur in ankylosing spondylitis and in other illnesses that are associated with ankylosing spondylitis. What are some of the cutaneous lesions? Well, if you have psoriasis, then you develop nail lesions. We'll see a picture of this. You can also get a rash called keratoderma blenorragicum on the sole of your feet. They get very thick scaly lesions on the sole of the feet, and this can be seen with reactive arthritis as well as psoriatic arthritis. I also talked to you about the erythema nodosum, which is the nodular lesion that you see on the shin with patients with inflammatory bowel disease. What about periarticular or manifestations that occur around the joints rather than inside the joints? Well, tendinitis, which we talked about, in the Achilles tendon and other, other tendon attachment, enthesitis, which is inflammation of ligaments that attach to various bones, and it is enthesitis that results in the syndesmophytes that we saw in the spine earlier. This enthesitis in the spine also results in bone loss in the spine, and you can develop osteoporosis in, uh, at a very young age, age in both women and men affected with ankylosing spondylitis. The diagnosis of osteoporosis can be very tricky because there's newborn formation that makes the spine look better than it should be because of ankylosis, and this raises the score of, for bone in the spine artificially. The hip joint is a better area that one can look for osteoporosis in uh, patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, osteoporosis will increase the risk for fracture in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Um, 
The other thing is dactylitis. We have a slide on this we'll show you. Uveitis and conjunctivitis can be seen. Uveitis can be seen with any of the conditions, any of the spondyloarthritis conditions. Uh, conjunctivitis is usually seen with reactive arthritis, where you get it after a genitourinary or a bowel infection. Gastrointestinal manifestations are important. They not only occur in the um, spondylitis and arthritis that accompanies inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but it, it can also be an asymptomatic type of inflammation that occurs in the bowel in up to 60 percent, 30 to 60 percent of patients with ankylosing spondylitis. They do not have any symptoms of it, but if you do a colonoscopy or an endoscopy, you can see inflammation in the bowel. And this may be important in the pathogenesis of the illness, and there's active research going on in this area. And symptomatic colitis can occur. It, it is uh, wide, widely known that anti-inflammatory medicines are one of the uh, most commonly used medications to treat it. With this asymptomatic, asymptomatic gut inflammation, it, uh, it behooves us to be careful about um, using these drugs and monitoring carefully for uh, any kind of bleeding. Urethritis, vaginitis, and balanitis occurs in the genital urinary tract. Um, the other extra articular manifestation that is important is carditis, where you can get inflammation of the large blood vessel or the aorta, can result in aortic insufficiency where the valve leaks, and sometimes you need to have a valve replacement done. These are late manifestations. The manifestations in the heart and in the lung that occur are all late manifestations. In the lung, the typical uh, problem is fibrosis or scarring in the upper part of the lung. And it's a late manifestation that can occur 10 to 20 years into the uh, illness. Here's a slide of uveitis. Uh, you can see the conjunctiva, the white part of the eye, is red and inflamed. There, there is also, um, though it's not very easy to see, whitish deposits on the um, cornea, on the back of the cornea, due to inflammatory cells sticking to the back of the eye. There's a lot of photophobia or sun sensitivity with it. It can occur either in one eye, or, yeah, but it's more typically bilateral in patients with spondyloarthritis. There are separate genes that lead to uveitis in patients with uh, ankylosing spondylitis and related illnesses, and this gene has been identified. Enthesitis refers to tendon inflammation, and here's inflammation of the Achilles tendon at its sites of uh, attachment in the heel. Um, and uh, this is uh, a common manifestation, particularly in children or childhood uh, uh, onset spondyloarthritis. Here is a, a slide showing dactylitis, which is a sausage-shaped digit. You can see how the index finger is, looks more like a sausage, um, and this manifestation can be seen in any of the subtypes of spondyloarthritis. Here is a slide that shows dactylitis or uh, a sausage digit in the toe. The third and fourth toe are affected, and you can see nail involvement that's typical of psoriatic arthritis in, in this patient. So this is a psoriatic arthritis patient with dactylitis. Here is psoriasis. Uh, you can see the plaque-like uh, lesions on the elbow of this patient uh, with a lot of inflammation and erythema. Here is nail involvement in psoriasis that gives the uh, thickening of the nail as well as uh, scaling and uh, a lifting of the nail off the nail bed. An important differential is a fungal infection. So we try to put all these symptoms together and come up with a, a score in our mind as to what is the likelihood of a spondyloarthritis being present. And you can see different manifestations here and a score next to it. And on the bottom of the uh, all the numbers, you'll see that a diagnosis of spondyloarthritis requires a score of six. Well, this is just one of the classification criteria 
used for research in patients with spinal arthritis. But just to give you an idea of, you know, mentally what you need to, um, you know, what is the likelihood of you having spinal arthritis, one could put uh, together a, a checklist like this, add up the scores, and come up with a likelihood of having it. Remember, this is not diagnostic criteria. It's very difficult to establish a diagnosis, but you can classify patients for research based on the use of these criteria where you assemble a group of patients that have similar characteristics and you say, well, I'm 100% uh, certain or 98% certain that this group has spinal arthritis because they all have a score of greater than 6 and therefore they're more likely to have uh, spinal arthritis. In order to have ankylosing spondylitis, you have to have the sacroiliitis present on x-ray either a grade 2, which is early sacroiliitis in, on both sides of the, um, the spinal column, or a unilateral grade 3, which is, or grade 4, which is more severe involvement where there's fusion. Uh, granted, these are later manifestations, and with early uh, ankylosing spondylitis and associated illnesses, you're more likely to see all the other symptoms listed here without any um, any x-ray manifestations. Perhaps MRI would be positive in early ankylosing spondylitis. We will talk a little bit more about the gene that's commonly involved, and there are a couple more that have been recently discovered. We'll talk about HLA-B27 and a family history of spinal arthritis and how important they are in establishing a diagnosis early. So going to the HLA gene, this is the chromosome 6 and chromosome 6 has different classes of uh, genes in there. And the HLA gene um, is one of the genes that is of paramount importance in ankylosing spondylitis. The HLA gene um, has three classes, the A, B, and C class. The B class has a subset called B27. And there are different types of B27, uh, B genes, ranging from B, uh, B1, B2, and uh, several other B subclasses. The B27 has a specific importance for ankylosing spondylitis because in the white Caucasian population, about 80 to 90 percent of patients with ankylosing spondylitis will be positive for the HLA-B27 gene. And this was discovered by, quite by accident when they were doing research on gout patients to see what genes predispose to gout. They used a control population with AS, and to their surprise, they noticed that the AS, pop, AS population had 80% um, uh, of them had the B27 gene, and there was no uh, HLA gene that correlated with the uh, gout population. So. If you look at the associations, the ankylosing spondylitis has an 80 to 90 percent association. But if you look at specific ethnicities, such as the African American population or the Asian population, the um, association is much less. It is probably 30 to 50 percent of um, patients in those ethnicities who will test positive for HLA-B27. That is because the background prevalence or the number of individuals who are African American or Chinese who have the HLA-B27 gene is a lot less. In the Caucasian population, about 8% have the HLA-B27 gene. In the African American or Asian, it's more like 1%, and that's why it associates less um, strongly with, uh, with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. You can see reactive arthritis scores high in, in uh, some studies. Juvenile spinal arthropathy, especially the subset that have spinal pain, uh, scores high at 70 percent. Uh, in inflammatory bowel disease and psoriatic arthritis, the interesting thing is that if you have spine involvement, you score high. As you can see with psoriatic arthritis, if you have spine involvement and spondylitis, then you have 50 percent association with HLA-B27. Without, it's only 15 percent. Undifferentiated spinal arthritis. Uh, depending on the subset you look at, if it's mostly peripheral and there's no inflammatory back pain, then you do not associate 
um, if you have inflammatory back pain, you do associate with it. HLA-V27 uh, uh, association with uveitis, about 50%. Aortic insufficiency and heart block, if you look at certain subsets of them, even though they don't have ankylosing spondylitis, there is an association with HLA-B27. HLA-B27 has been studied in, in rats. These are rats that do not have this gene. This is a human gene. But they, when they put the human HLA-B27 gene into Lewis rats and put extra copies of them in each cell, the rats developed diarrhea, colitis, or inflammation of the colon, arthritis, spondylitis, nail disease, and uh, testes uh, inflammation or, or architis. Um, the interesting aspect of this was also that if the rat was maintained in a sterile environment where there was no bacteria that could colonize their colon after birth, then these HLA-B27 positive rats did not develop spondylitis. This goes into the environment and uh, the environment's influence on the development of spondylitis. And there are many researchers that have looked into the diet and also specific bacteria that may be associated with the uh, development of spondylitis. Right now, the uh, researchers believe that since bowel flora is pretty ubiquitous and we all have it, it is not a specific thing that triggers ankylosing spondylitis, but however, it is an important cofactor in the development of spondylitis in a patient who has all the right genes to develop it. So if it's possible to keep people in a bubble where they don't get colonized with uh, the flora that uh, colonizes all babies by the time they are two or three days of age, then I guess you would uh, be protected against it. But this is not practical. And even diets that are low in starch that have been widely recommended to uh, decrease bacterial flora and therefore try to decrease the symptoms of AS are not very effective. Yes, people do feel better when they eat more healthy and avoid things that have refined flour and uh, sugars and starches in them. People do feel better, and I think that would be a healthy reason to do it. Um, but that should not be the only approach taken to control the spondylitis. So besides the other re piece of research that I mentioned to detect early AS uh, initiated, initiated by the Spondylitis Association of America, we, we uh, raised about 200,000 about 10 years ago to spur genetic research in ankylosing spondylitis. And this C grant went on to uh, garner the attention of the NIH, and the NIH came forward with uh, an initial grant of uh, a few million dollars. Uh, that led to the first round of research. Then there was another grant for approximately four to five million dollars. That led to a consortium of researchers around the globe in Australia, in England, and in the United States that led to the identification of two genes called the ARTS1 gene and the IL-23 receptor gene. The ARTS1 gene is a gene that helps to cleave or separate tumor necrosis factor, which is a protein that's important in the generation of symptoms in ankylosing spondylitis, symptoms of inflammation in the spine and in the joints. Well, this, G, this uh, protein helps to remove tumor necrosis factor from the surface of the cells, the immune cells that express it. And there may be some importance on how well this gene works and whether you're likely to get the disease or not. The IL-23 receptor is a receptor that is well expressed on the cells lining the gastrointestinal tract. And Again, going back to the 50% to 60% of patients who have asymptomatic, asymptomatic bowel inflammation in ankylosing spondylitis, it uh, is interesting that a gene that is expressed in the bowel also carries an increased risk of developing the illness. These will lead, lead to new treatments. In fact, an IL-23 receptor blocker is in uh, uh, stages of uh, 
of clinical trials with, in, uh, with Crohn's disease right now. If you put these genes together with uh, HLA-B27, about 70% of the susceptibility to the disease can be explained. Obviously, uh, we believe that 95% of the uh, susceptibility to the illness is genetic, so another 25% of the illness is uh, due to genes that are unknown at the present time, and uh, further re research is ongoing. If you look at AS in the United States, we, this is a survey that was done a long time ago. It is probably very inaccurate. We believe that the prevalence is more like 0.5% of the U.S. population. There is a study that's ongoing right now, which the SA is supporting, um, where uh, the CDC is going around and screening people around the country who are asymptomatic, have not been diagnosed, to see how many of them will have a, 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 a early AS that has restriction in mobility with all the symptoms. And the screening questionnaire that I mentioned is being used for that as well. So this uh, early slide data from Amgen shows that about 146,000 of the AS patients that are predicted to exist in the, in the U.S. population is diagnosed. And there are about 179,000 that are undiagnosed and untreated. And of these 146,000, you can see that about 50,000 have severe disease or are abused. It's interesting to note that even though people have severe disease and, or are fused, treatment with the new treatments with TNF blockers is still uh, of benefit. Um, the people who have mild disease, the 55,000 patients, will probably uh, be able to be treated with an anti-inflammatory medicine alone. Moderate disease often requires a more um, uh, a, a stronger medication to treat it. But we believe the prevalence is more likely to be one and a half million people than the 325,000 that's depicted in this slide. Um, and this is the study that I mentioned. Um, and uh, we are supporting the study. Uh, pharma companies are providing funding for it. It will go on for about five years, and we'll have an accurate number. And it's, this number is important to obtain because it will spur interest from pharma companies and NIH to fund more research into um, a ankylosing spondylitis and the related illnesses. Well, let's switch gears to treatment. Well, tri NSAIDs have been uh, the cornerstone of treatment for a long time before we developed new uh, treatments. You can see uh, on this slide the, some of the traditional NSAIDs, and all of these uh, NSAIDs have been approved for ankylosing spondylitis. It was very easy for the manufacturers of NSAIDs to study these in, uh, in these illnesses. They just had to do a short study with a small sample of patients and prove efficacy very easily. Here you can see um, two different kinds of NSAIDs in the sli slide. COX-1 uh, specific, oh, I'm sorry, COX-2 specific uh, NSAIDs are the ones that are um, uh, belong to the family of uh, Celecoxib. Celecoxib, as you can see here with this blue line, peaked around 2005 in its use. The, the claim to fame that was that there was there's less uh, gastrointestinal side effects with uh, this uh, illness, and, I'm sorry, with this uh, NSAID, and so people started using it with ankylosing spondylitis, but then the cardiovascular side effect of it came up with, uh, with Vioxx, and that led to a sharp decrease in the use of NSAIDs with uh, with, uh, as you can see, in 2005, 2006, it went down and plateaued off. The important thing to realize is that whether it's COX-2 specific or non-specific, such as diclofenac or nap naproxen or meloxicam, they, they all work for uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And in 50% of patients who have milder disease, it, it, it does help. It is also important to note that one of the the important things that leads to the early diagnosis is a response to NSAIDs 
with 50% of your symptoms going away with the use of NSAIDs, which is considered to be one of the um, clues to the di diagnosis of this illness. When you look at the selective NSAIDs, you can see the list up here. As you can see, Vioxx was withdrawn in 2004 because of its link to increased cardiovascular disease. It was used inappropriately in people who were elderly. It was used in higher doses than it should have been. The dose for acute pain was 50 milligram, and this was used continuously to treat patients who had mechanical back pain or other causes of chronic pain and arthritis. And this raised the blood pressure in patients and uh, caused heart attacks. It probably does not have to do with the, its effects on platelets or the endothelium of the blood vessels, but uh, being a long-acting medication with a very long half-life, Vioxx was more prone to this side effect because one dose uh, from one day overlapped in its eff effect on the dose on a subsequent day. So there was uninterrupted effects on the kidney leading to salt and water retention and hypertension developing. Some of the other COX-2 selective inhibitors are still in use, such as celecoxib in the United States and uh, Ar Arcoxia in, in uh, Europe and Prexige also in Europe. The, this is a slide that shows the short-term and long-term efficacy in ankylosing spondylitis. This is comparing Feldene or Pyroxicam with uh, Meloxicam or Mobic uh, and uh, placebo on the top. And this slide shows withdrawing from the study because of lack of efficacy. And you can see that more patients with placebo withdraw from the study. About 60% have withdrawn from the study at 52 weeks compared to uh, only 20 or 25% in the meloxicam group withdrawing. You can uh, see a higher rate of withdrawal with a lower dose of meloxicam or mobi and in a non-selective NSAID possibly due to side effects on the gastrointestinal tract where you get more peptic ulcer disease or gastritis with these non-selective NSAIDs. Mobic tends to be uh, non-selective in uh, higher doses of more than 22.5 milligrams and more selective on the COX-2 enzyme in, in lower doses. There is some thought as to whether NSAIDs are disease-modifying drugs, and uh, only one study has shown that it is disease-modifying, where the spinal fusion in uh, NSAID use continuously when taken as a daily, nightly dose showed that there was decrease in spinal fusion compared to on-demand use of NSAID just as needed for back pain. But this has not been validated, again, in subsequent studies. Therefore, it's very early. What about these other drugs that are used? Well, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, thalidomide, leflunamide, uh, and I would add to this list intravenous uh, pamidronate have all been used to treat ankylosing spondylitis with vari variable uh, efficacy. I should mention that on this slide, all these drugs are more effective in treating the peripheral manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis, which would be the hip arthritis or peripheral arthritis that is associated with the other types of spinal arthritis. There are side effects with all these drugs, including um, liver and blood count abnormalities with sulfasalazine and methotrexate, propensity for blood clots with thalidomide and neuropathy or nerve symptoms. Um, nerve damage symptoms with numbness and pain in the feet or the hands with thalidomide. Leflunomide can cause liver toxicity, and in young uh, women, it, it should be used in caution because it can cause birth defects and needs to be stopped um, way ahead of time before a, a woman uh, tries to become pregnant. They're not very useful for the spinal manifestations of ankylosing spondylitis. Well, people uh, researchers in the U.S. looked at what uh, patients should be considered to receive the biologics or the, uh, the, the uh, TNF inhibitors in ankylosing spondylitis. The researchers said that 
you should have sacroiliitis by um, new, new criteria on x-ray before you use a, a biologic. I do not agree with that. Uh, I think that any patient that fails anti-inflammatory medications should be uh, allowed to use the, the, uh, the biologics. Um, the disease scoring is sometimes used. And basically, a physician global assessment of moderate disease, I think, uh, is adequate to uh, qualify for a biologic. A BAS dye is a disease score that is made by asking questions of uh, severity on a 10-centimeter uh, line, basically asking how stiff you are in your morning, how much pain you have, how is your function affected, and so on, and then scoring them to see that you have at least a score of 4 centimeter on the 0 10 to 10 centimeter line on an average, um, often done, not done in clinical practice, but uh, is a useful measure in, in, in research. Previous therapy should have also failed, and previous therapy includes um, the uh, NSAIDs that uh, you have to have used for three months. Um, they, they prefer the use of two NSAIDs, for one for each, one each for six weeks, and a failure would be defined as less than 50% improvement of symptoms on an anti-inflammatory medication. If you don't tolerate NSAIDs because of uh, bowel inflammation or gastritis, that would be adequate as a trial, and you do not have to keep going from one NSAID to another. If you have spinal symptoms, then one would go on to use one of the biologics. If you had peripheral arthritis, then you would need to fail not only the two NSAIDs, but you would also need to have either intolerability or uh, lack of response to sulfasalazine, which I mentioned earlier, or methotrexate for peripheral arthritis. You do not, uh, you're not required to fail sulfasalazine or methotrexate for axial disease or enthesitis because um, th these uh, do not res help to resolve uh, particularly axial disease symptoms, which is the spine, spine symptoms. So let's look at one of the biologics that's used to treat uh, ankylosing spondylitis. This is adalimumab or Humira. This slide depicts a commonly used uh, improvement criteria to assess um, uh, improvement. The ASAS 20, to be positive, requires a 20% improvement in at least three of the four domains listed below. A patient global response, meaning how much better you are, that should improve by at least 20%. Patient uh, perceived pain on a visual analog scale of 0 to 10 centimeters, that should improve by 20%. Or function uh, uh, measured by a bath and closing spondylitis functional index questionnaire should improve by 20%. Or inflammation, which is stiffness, should improve by 20%. If you have three out of four improved, and you have no worsening of the remaining fourth domain, then you are a patient who has met this 20% improvement criteria. Well, it, in Humira, when it was tried for AAS, well, you can see that about 50% of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 40% met, met the 40% improvement criteria for AAS. So basically, there was an improvement of uh, in symptoms of at least three out of the four domains in uh, for in 40.9% uh, patients who received Humira in this clinical trial. Now, uh, the response to Humira is usually sustained, but there are patients who will respond initially and then lose efficacy over one or two years who should be switched to another TNF blocker because there are patients who will respond to uh, the other TNF blockers, which I will show you in a minute, because they differ in their, um, uh, the, the structure and uh, also the levels to which they are, um, they, they are present in the blood during administration. Humira is a monoclonal antibody, an antibody synthesized that is fully human and will bind to tumor necrosis factor, which is a key protein that causes some of these symptoms. 
this is etanercept or Enbro, and this is the ASAS 20 uh, uh, response. At 24 weeks, you can see that 57% of patients met this ASAS 20%, 20 response, whereas only 22% uh, percent of AS patients who are on NSAIDs met this response. Enbrel is different from um, Humira in that it is a fusion receptor where you take the tumor necrosis factor receptor, which we spoke about earlier, that sits on top of the, the immune cells, you bind two of them together and you inject it into the body as a subcutaneous injection and basically mop up free floating TNF that's causing inflammation and mop up TNF that's attached to cells that is causing inflammation and uh, relieve symptoms. So it's a different structure and when, when Humira fails, it's often a good idea to try Tanacept, which is an injection very similar to Humira that's used in the treatment of ASM related diseases. Mobility measures to improve. We talked about two mobility measures, the Schober's test and the chest expansion. This is a measure of mobility of the cervical spine, which is usually restricted in more advanced disease. The line A measures the disease from the ear cartilage to the wall. The line B measures it from the base of the skull to the wall. And you can see in this uh, study of Etanus that the mobility measures improved. So, the Schober's test improved by 10%. There was an increase in the line by 10% when you looked at the patients on etanercept compared to placebo. Placebo improved by 0%. Chest expansion improved by 16.7%. Occiput to wall, which is a measure we saw earlier, improved by 25%. Whether this is a decrease in fusion or an improvement in pain symptoms is a matter of debate. Most people believe that it's an improvement in pain symptoms that um, cause an improvement in the spinal mobility. This is a trial of Iplismab or Remicade, which is the third medicine that is approved for ankylosing spondylitis. Infliximab is different in that it's given intravenously. And because it's given intravenously, there are very high levels of the drug given as a bolus to patients intravenously, and patients respond differently. So again, if you fail one of the other medicines, there's good reason to switch to another drug. And infliximab is different, not only because it's present in high doses, but it's a monoclonal antibody. It has some foreign proteins, such as a mouse protein, and this can result in the, uh, the, uh, a, a different mechanism of action. It can also result in resistance over time because the body recognizes this foreign protein and blocks its effect. Using Remicade and Humira is also important for patients with the related diseases. Remicade and Humira will treat inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, whereas Enbro will not treat it. It's also been postulated that these uh, drugs, Remicade and Humira, may be better for uveitis and skin manifestations such as psoriasis, in uh, patients with psoriatic arthritis and spondylitis. Um, uh, the Enbro does respond as well, to, uh, does have an effect on psoriasis as well, but uh, to a lesser extent. There is a fourth drug that has been approved, which is golimumab or Symphony. Symphony is a, uh, a, a drug that's self-administered once a month. It has been approved in ankylosing spondylitis, one of the latest drugs to be approved. And there are other drugs that are in research stages. One of them is Orencia or Abatacet, which is not a tumor necrosis factor blocker, but in, uh, interferes with the communications of immune cells that results in expansion of the immune cells, resulting in more disease-causing immune cells. Here's a slide of a patient before and after treatment with Remicade or infliximab, you can see that the inflammation that was present on the slide disappeared, uh, on this slide in the sacroiliac joint, disappeared after treatment with infliximab, showing that inflammation uh, mediated by TNF goes away. And on this sagittal view or cross-sectional view, 
of the spine, you can see inflammation where the ligaments attach uh, in the spine also tended to get attenuated and disappear in patients with uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis of six years duration uh, treated with infliximab. What about safety? Well, there's no drug that's 100 percent safe. The anti-inflammatory medicines, as we mentioned, cause peptic ulcer disease, gastritis, liver function abnormalities, salt and water retention, hypertension, may dispose to heart attacks. But in the hands of the best uh, physicians, and you know, the best physicians to handle patients with spinal arthritis are the rheumatologists. They are well in tune of these uh, side effects that occur due to these drugs and can monitor you. There, is, there are some patients, some physicians who believe that the tumor necrosis factor inhibitor drugs, which we talked about earlier, may be even safer than the traditional disease-modifying drugs, uh, such as methotrexate and sulfasalazine and thalidomide that we spoke about a few slides before. There is uh, less bone marrow side effects or blood count effects, less liver side effects, less kidney toxicity, and uh, perhaps less inf infections with tumor necrosis factor inhibitor treatment. I do not agree with that completely. There are infections that do occur with tumor necrosis factor inhibitor treatment. One thing that we have to particularly be cautious about is tuberculosis. Every patient who goes on uh, who is initiating treatment with Enbrel, Remicade, Humira, or the new drug Symphony has to have a TB skin test to uh, see if they were exposed to TB in the past. If they are, have been exposed to TB in the past, the skin test will be positive. You have to have treatment with a uh, TB medicine, typically uh, INH, for at least three weeks prior to the uh, initiation of tumor necrosis factor inhibition uh, therapy. The INH is usually continued for six to nine months to kill any lingering TB bacteria that may be uh, in, the, in your body that is not causing an infection but can be unmasked and can cause full-blown tuberculosis if not treated with this uh, INH drug prior to starting the TNF inhibition treatment. What about uh, other illnesses, well, TNF inhibition should be avoided in people who have multiple sclerosis because it seems to make multiple sclerosis worse. Uh, so anybody who has had a seizure in the past with ankylosing spondylitis should have MRIs done to uh, exclude any demyelination in the brain or spinal cord, um, which can worsen with the use of TNF inhibitors. Drug uh, lupus patients should avoid TNF inhibitors because lupus can be made worse. Um, patients who are very prone to infections, like people with diabetes or people with uh, open fistulas, which are openings in, from the bowel into the uh, skin or perianal areas, in inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, have to be, use these uh, medications uh, with caution. Uh, there is encouraging data that TNF inhibitors actually help these fistula to close up. So uh, when treated, when used with appropriate antibiotics, it may actually make these conditions better. Lastly, about tumors and uh, TNF inhibition, well, TNF inhibitors have been closely studied to see whether the effects on the immune system will increase the, the, uh, uh, the ma uh, manifestations of tumors um, in uh, in, in patients treated with an for ankylosing spondylitis. Um, the bottom line is skin tumors such as uh, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, tends to be increased in patients with ankylosing spondylitis treated with TNF blocker drugs compared to traditional DMODs like methotrexate or sulfasalazine. But this is something that is easily de detectable and treatable and it's not uh, uh, something that's seen in every patient treated with a TNF blocker. But some of the other more serious manifestations, um, uh, such as the occurrence of lymphoma, the occurrence of lung cancer or breast cancer, is not increased with uh, treatment with TNF inhibition. And multiple large 
registries of ankylosing spondylitis patients treated with TNF inhibitors have shown that there is no increased risk of um, uh, lymphoma or other solid tumors uh, at the present time. And this is, uh, has been shown mostly in rheumatoid arthritis. There will be data that's forthcoming on AS in the near future. Lastly, what should be the future um, of research? Uh, we will be supporting and uh, encouraging research in these arenas. We need therapies to prevent fusion. Um, we uh, believe that the current drugs, the TNF inhibitors, do not prevent fusion, but we need to treat patients with earlier illness, um, less than three years of involvement, in order to really answer that questions. We need to identify what the environmental triggers are because even if you take identical twins who have the illness, only 50% of identical twins will be concordant for the illness, 50 to 70% of them. But, you know, even though they have the same genes, not every uh, set of twins will have disease present in both pairs. And then, you know, we need to find out what are the genetic and other factors that separate the various subset of patients with spinal arthritis, what makes them uh, different, what makes them very similar, um, and uh, we hope to support research in the future on that as well. I will uh, go on and stop and take any questions if there are uh, any at the present time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Halegwa. Um, I've opened up, you should see a questions pane um, now on your control panel, so go ahead and you can type your questions in, and they can be sent to me. Um, Dr. Halegwa, can you change um, presenter abilities so that I can bring up my, um, so I can give them my email address, so if their question is not answered today, they'll know where to email me. There we go. Okay. Um, so we did get a lot of questions um, before the webinar today, and so Dr. Halegwa um, tried to work a lot of the answers of those questions into his presentation today, but we do have some lingering ones besides there, besides the ones um, that he answered during his presentation. Um, so if you feel like your question wasn't answered at the end of today, please um, email me your question and we'll do our best to get them answered. Dr. Halegua, one question we have is, can peripheral neuropathy be connected to AS? Um, peripheral neuropathy is not a typical manifestation of AS. It can be the complication of therapy in AS with drugs such as thalidomide, uh, methotrexate and leflunamide or Arava um, used for treatment in AS. It could uh, also be seen, uh, but not typically as peripheral neuropathy, but as a late manifestation of AS, you can get what is called cauda equina syndrome, where you, uh, you damage the spinal nerves in the lumbar spine due to the changes that occurs in the spinal canal due to ankylosing spondylitis. And this results in numbness and uh, tingling sensation more in the saddle distribution, meaning the part of the body that comes into contact with the uh, saddle when you sit on a horse. So the buttock, upper thigh areas, lower back areas, those are the areas where you get numbness and tingling that is uh, suggestive of a neuropathy. But um, typically, peripheral neuropathy is not seen with AS, and there are many other reasons to develop that. Okay, thank you. Does AS affect um, the libido medically in any way? Um, well, uh, I, I guess that would depend on what chronic disease does to testosterone levels and, you know, libido in general. Um, and I, I believe that you know, chronic illnesses that result in inflammation do lower hormonal levels, um, and uh, you know that can result in uh, decrease in libido. In in addition, cardiovascular disease is a, a prominent problem in patients with inflammatory illness, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, 
lupus or ankylosing spondylitis. And as you know, with cardiovascular disease, it's not just the heart that's uh, affected. The blood vessels all over the body are affected, and if blood flow to the erectile organs is affected, then you can see uh, an effect uh, not only on libido, but also performance in uh, patients with ankylosing spondylitis. There's also, you know, unique uh, difficulty in uh, patients with uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis with hip involvement and uh, spine involvement where um, they, there can be difficulty with the uh, intercourse because of the, the restrictions involved um, and um, hip replacement and sometimes spine uh, surgery may, may be able to alleviate those. Okay. What are some of the ways to counter the fatigue um, that spondylitis causes? Um, fatigue is a common symptom in uh, chronic inflammatory illnesses. The uh, f fatigue is often mediated by some of the cytokines like tumor necrosis factor that's present in the illness. So if you treat the illness with a tumor necrosis factor blocker like Enbrel, Remcade, Humira, or Symphony, fatigue may improve if it is related to the cytokine issue. If it's not related to the cytokine issue, then it will not respond, only partially respond to it. In that case, one should look at the other possibilities for fatigue, and the list is very long, but my experience is that patients with chronic inflammatory illness affect the autonomic nervous system, and this is the nervous system that helps us respond to different activities that we do, do during the day, getting up from a chair, walking, changing positions. If the blood, vessel, blood vessels and blood pressure do not respond very readily to those changes in position, then we will uh, uh, experience fatigue due to dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, which is difficult to treat but can be managed as long as one, you know, really tailors one's activity to the amount of energy that one has during the day and try to spread your activities over several days rather than trying to do a lot in one day when you have a good day. Okay. We have uh, two questions related to uh, childhood spondyloarthritis. The first question is how do you diagnose juvenile um, ankylosing spondylitis? And the second question is what is the outcome uh, in young children that are being treated for ankylosing spondylitis? So diagnosis and outcome. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, a, a majority of patients who have juvenile spondyloarthritis present with fever and with enthesitis or inflammation um, of the tendon attachments and ligament attachments in the, in the feet, in the ankle, uh, in the hip or upper extremities. They may have arthritis in one joint or the other, such as a, a knee or an ankle may be the only joint involved. And the spine is often spared and there's no inflammatory spinal pain. About 50% of them will go on to develop spine involvement over the course of 5 to 10 years. But a lot of them don't and just remain with the arthritis in one joint and the enthesitis um, in, in uh, a joint as well. So it's, it's important for pediatric rheumatologists and pediatricians uh, in, uh, to be cognizant of the way that um, ankylosing spondylitis presents in, in the juvenile period. And any uh, uh, child with uh, chronic fever of unknown origin that lasts for more than six weeks should be entertained. Um, this, this diagnosis should be entertained and appropriate imaging modalities with MRIs directed at areas where there's pain at the attachment of ligaments needs to be carried out. And often, you know, diagnosis takes several months to establish. Okay. And the second part of the question was, what is the outcome of it? Well, um, the Spondylitis Association 
initiated a study called the AS Life Impact Study about uh, 15 years ago, I believe. And the results of that showed that people with um, AS of childhood onset fared worse than um, people who had adult onset AS in terms of its severity and in terms of how um, badly the spine fared um, in, in terms of fusion later on in the illness. So if that can be reproduced, I think, you know, it indicates that childhood spinal arthritis needs to be taken very seriously and treated aggressively. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for mild AS, is Indesin still appropriate if it is relatively effective, or would it be better to try one of the newer drugs? My uh, preference would be to use the anti-inflammatory medicines if all the disease manifestations are controlled. Therefore, you know, if you use the anti-inflammatory medicine, you have less than 30 minutes of morning stiffness. You don't wake up at night with pain, and pain during the day is, is at least 50% less than what it used to be. Um, and, you know, your x-rays don't show any signs of uh, damage in the spine, uh, meaning squaring of the vertebra is not present. Um, the, the, the markers of poor prognosis are lack of response to NSAIDs, and uh, secondly, pre-existing damage in the spine, so squaring of vertebra, um, any syndesmophyte in the spine, are markers of, of uh, worse outcome. And there is an experimental marker called metalloproteinase 3 or MMP3 level. If that's elevated at baseline, meaning early on in the illness, that predicts more damage in the future. So if any of these poor prognostic matters are, are present, then one should switch the TNF blockers. And if they're absent, I think continuing with indocin and monitoring very carefully kidney, liver function, and any stomach side effects um, should be adequate. Okay. We're getting close to when we were supposed to end. Do you have time for um, a few more questions, Dr. I Hullen? Do. Okay, great. Then we'll just keep on. And um, like I said, if you have to jump off because it's getting close to – um, 11.30 Pacific time, the recording will be available in the member area, including these questions. Um, okay, another question. Is it safe to visit a chiropractor to help maintain movement or flexibility in a newly diagnosed 17-year-old? I would be very cautious about uh, seeing a chiropractor if you have ankylosing spondylitis. The syndesmophytes that you see and the osteoporosis that I said exists in patients with ankylosing spondylitis makes you particularly prone for fracture of the syndesmophytes and the vertebrae in patients with AS. And that can be devastating because it leads to immobility and, you know, perhaps predisposing to even more fusion um, due to the healing process that's involved after a fracture. In fact, uh, some of you may be aware of an initiative made by the Spondylitis Association to educate first responders and um, uh, people in the emergency room about the special precautions that need to be taken with the ankylosing spondylitis patients during transport to the hospital as well, well as during intubation where a tube is put down into the windpipe to assist with breathing. If patients are strapped back on the stretchers at the site of the accident very forcefully, that can result in a fracture. If you're intubated where the head is forcefully put backwards and uh, to put the tube down into the windpipe, it can result in fractures and damage to the, um, to the spine. Therefore, I would be very, very careful about uh, avoiding chiropractors if you have ankylosing spondylitis. I am not putting them down. I just don't think that there is a place for chiropractic manipulation in ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, thank you. And about that EMS video, if you want more information about that, if you visit our home page, on the right-hand side there is a link to more information about that EMS video that we just uh, finished producing. Um, 
another question. When sacroiliitis is shown to be active, would antibiotics be effective? Um, antibiotics do not have a role in treating um, ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, there is research that is ongoing to see what role there is in um, bacteria with the reactive arthritis subset of uh, uh, spondyloarthritis. There is some uh, evidence in the literature that if you have reactive arthritis that um, is diagnosed early within a month or two, and you can show that chlamydia initiated that reactive arthritis, then treatment with antibiotics for chlamydia early on in the course of reactive arthritis can alter the course of the, the reactive arthritis, meaning you can shorten the duration of reactive arthritis, but antibiotics have not been shown to alter the course, of, course or symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis in, in, any, in any way. That said, when you use antibiotics for, let's say, an upper respiratory tract infection or a urinary tract infection, you will kill off the bowel flora that's in the intestine. And when you kill off the bowel flora, people feel better because there's less immune stimulation for the time being. But it's a very impractical and dangerous approach to treat because you will foster ba bacterial resistance to antibiotic if you take it in indefinitely, and it can uh, lead to a super infection with a resistant bacteria, which is not, not a good thing. Okay. Is prednisone a common medication to be used in addition to NSAIDs? Um, it, it is. It can be used, and it is effective in decreasing inflammation, particularly in the peripheral joints affected by ankylosing spondylitis. I would use it in the lowest dose possible, perhaps not more than 20 milligram a day, and I would use it for the shortest period of time to treat a flare, um, perhaps you know two weeks, maximum of six weeks in tapering doses. It is important to know that combinations of prednisone and anti-inflammatory medication create more cases of peptic ulcer disease than the, the anti-inflammatory medicines or, pep, or prednisone used alone. So the combination in, uh, for a longer duration of time of more than two to six weeks can be particularly dangerous with uh, the side effects of uh, peptic ulcer disease and bleeding. Okay. What are the risks of using TNF medication while pregnant? Should the use be stopped before even trying to conceive? Well, that, that is a uh, an interesting question. There is uh, evidence in the literature that shows that TNF inhibitors are useful for the couple that's in experiencing infertility to, for them to increase their success in becoming pregnant. So typically the woman uses the TNF inhibitor for a few months prior to attempting uh, either in vitro fertilization or natural um, fertilization. And then the TNF inhibitor is continued for a few months through pregnancy. And this has been the practice of the infertility specialist for several years. Um, however, some researchers have come up with a, 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 a compilation of uh, birth defects that seem to occur in higher frequency of patients who have used TNF inhibitors during pregnancy. And this has not been proven, but it's raised some concern, and at this time, the standard of care would be to stop the TNF inhibitors when you find out that you are pregnant, but I don't think there is any reason to suspect that, you know, you need to, uh, that there, there's an increased risk of birth uh, malformations if you've been on a TNF inhibitor for the first two or four weeks of pregnancy, because one was not aware that... Uh, one was pregnant or not. Okay. Another question that I know you touched upon during your presentation, but I think there's still confusion about this. Um, this person is asking, which medications present, prevent fusing? Um, I have to answer that question saying that at this time, 
we don't believe that any medications prevent fusion. That said, there is one Celebrex study done by a Dr. Wanders in, in France. They gave a Celebrex 200 milligram at bedtime continuously to a group of AS patients uh, for two years. And another uh, group of AS patients uh, concurrently was, was given Celebrex to be taken as needed. So the patients who took it continuously had a slight decrease in the amount of fusion when x-rays were compared at two years and uh, compared with x-rays at baseline. The patients who took it on demand did not show any change um, in the amount of fusion. So this is one study that has not been replicated. And when you compare the, the two groups, the number of Celebrex tablets seem to be about the same in both groups. So it sounds like, you know, they, they, it took the same amount of Celebrex, they just took it at different times. And does that make enough of a difference to inhibit inflammation at night that would prevent spinal uh, fusion? It's an open question. The problems with the TNF inhibitors is that they've been done, uh, the studies have been done more in established disease of five, six, ten years duration. And it is unethical to do t give TNF inhibitors to a group of patients for two years and uh, put a patient on placebo for two years. So most of these studies are of short duration of six months where patients are on placebo and where patients are on active drug. And those six months, you cannot detect a difference in x-rays showing limitation of fusion. And when patients are followed up and compared to two years, it's not possible to compare the placebo group anymore because the placebo group is on an active drug. So they've looked at historical cohorts where before the TNF inhibitors came in, there were AS patients that were treated with other drugs alone. The other drugs alone had a rate of fusion of, let's say, you know, 2.5. And when they looked at the two-year data with TNF inhibitors, it was the same, was 2.5. So the current studies show that the damage score on x-ray is very similar when you use TNF inhibitors at two years compared to historical cohorts that had similar uh, features to AS that was used for the study. Um, remember that this is established disease, and our hope is that if we treat AS earlier, that we can prevent fusion. Okay. I have two questions that are uh, somewhat related. Are there natural therapies that may help alleviate symptoms or modify the disease, and any help with pain control with acupuncture? Um, natural therapies may be of uh, some benefit in decreasing inflammation. It is uh, recognized that uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which are the fatty acids that channel inflammation in the body down a pathway where there's less uh, generation of harmful or more pain generating inflammatory mediators. So these omega-3 fatty acids that are present in fish oil and flaxseed oil has been shown to be beneficial in reducing the symptoms in mild to moderate rheumatoid arthritis in controlled trials, and the same should apply for ankylosing spondylitis. But I have to emphasize that it's probably beneficial only to reduce the signs and symptoms of these illnesses in mild spondyloarthritis. And if you have moderate to severe uh, spondyloarthritis, that more traditional NSAIDs and the other drugs would be more beneficial. Um, the Second part of the question was what, Melissa? About acupuncture. Does oh. acupuncture help with pain control? Acupuncture is useful to relieve muscle um, spasm and pain and regional pain in any uh, painful musculoskeletal condition. It is difficult if there's diffuse pain all over the body, as can be the case with uh, ankylosing spondylitis uh, to relieve pain completely. But if there's a nagging problem 
in, in the neck or in, in, a, in a shoulder because of symptoms at a particular level in ankylosing spondylitis, acupuncture can be useful in reducing pain and, and uh, tightness in the, in the muscle at that level. But I don't think it would be useful for the diffuse uh, manifestations, um, which can be one of the presenting symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis, where you can get diffuse pain all over the body and can be mistaken as fibromyalgia. Okay. Can we just um, touch upon briefly, because we're running out of time, but just the importance of exercise um, and, and helping the disease. Can you talk about that, how important that is? Please. Well, exercise is very important in uh, maintaining uh, both muscular, muscular uh, strength and fitness and also maintaining proper posture in ankylosing spondylitis. If uh, we look at the progression of ankylosing spondylitis, one would see that patients tend to adopt a position of spinal flexion where the spine is bent forward and they often become fixed in this position. There uh, is evidence that if you do extension and stretching exercises of the neck and the spinal column that you can prevent your posture from getting stuck in a position of flexion and that even if you fuse your spine, if you have bad genes and you progress to fuse your spine, you can you know, fuse your spine in a more functional position where you maintain an erect posture and you're less prone to falling down, less prone to effects of the flex posture on, on your uh, stomach and breathing and uh, predisposed to uh, respiratory complications and malnutrition that can occur because you're not able to eat as much with your stomach being compressed by a bent rib cage on top of the uh, pelvis. So exercise is very important. There is a booklet that's available um, to, uh, to exercise on our website called the uh, Straight, Straight Talk on Spondylitis, which uh, helps one um, exercise with, with safely with spondylitis. There's also a DVD available that can be purchased from the website that can be very helpful as well. Okay. Well, I think um, I, I, this is going to be it. So if your question didn't get answered today, please send it to me, and uh, we'll do our best to, to get an answer to you. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Halegwa. I know I speak for many of our members when I say that, you know, we truly appreciate the time you spent today on this presentation and just the things that you do in general for the organization. So thank you very much. Um, You're very welcome. What I want to do today is just a couple of reminders before we end. Um, first of all, again, if you didn't get your question answered, um, send, send your question to me. We also want to make sure that you fill out uh, an evaluation of today's webinar. Um, so you'll see, you can see the address on your screen. You're going to go to spondylitis.org slash webinar survey, all one word. Um, you're also going to receive an email with the link to that survey in about an hour. So please um, complete that. Again, if you missed anything today, this webinar will be available in the member area of our website um, later this week, probably about Wednesday or Thursday. If you're not a member, please consider supporting us today. Um, joining SAA will give you access to that member area where as I said earlier, we have a library of podcasts. We have the archive of Spinalize Plus, and that's where we house all of the recordings of the webinars um, we have done. Um, so I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar. We hope it provided you with a lot of valuable information, and we hope that you will join us for the next um, webinar or seminar in your area. We're going to be in Houston uh, July 25th, and then again in Kansas City in September. Um, so check back on our uh, seminar and events page um, and the four patients section so you can see what events are coming up. So thank you again. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.